following presentation is from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland. Gospel of Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. As Jesus taught, he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor and banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearances, say long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Lord, we thank you today. For your, for your word. And we thank you that as we've gathered together in your name, that you are here in our midst, as we've come to bless your name and to worship you and to bow down before you. Lord, we ask that as we explore your word together, that you would speak to our hearts, that you would help us to understand it and to apply this word to our lives, that we might be the disciples that you're calling us to be. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus, he who is the word made flesh. Amen and amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Jesus called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the treasury, for she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Now sometimes our interpretation of a biblical passage hinges on the questions that we ask. And today, I want to begin with one central question, and that is, how do you hear Jesus' description of this poor widow's offering? How do you hear Jesus' description of this poor widow's offering? Is it praise? Is he praising her? Or is it a lament? Is he sad about what's going on? To put it another way, is Jesus holding up the widow and her offering as an example of great faith and profound stewardship, or is Jesus expressing his remorse that she has given, perhaps feels compelled to give, the little that she had left? Is it praise or lament? Now, for most of my life, I have thought that Jesus was praising this woman's offering. That's the way I've heard it preached. Preachers hold up this incident as being an example of generous giving. The widow becomes a role model, someone whose attitude the rest of us need to emulate and imitate. Although Jesus didn't say it, you could just tack on the phrase, go and do likewise as the conclusion of the story. You've heard those sermons too, haven't you? Especially during stewardship sermon season, right? Be like this widow, give until it hurts. She only had two coins and she gave them both. Oh, that is a fantastic way to encourage stewardship and giving. Just ask, what would the widow do? And sign those pledge cards. Man, some sermons just preach themselves. I could just sit down and be done, right? Is that what it is? But such a, a simplistic sermon and a simplistic reading of this text doesn't actually do justice to what Mark's doing here. As usually happens, Mark is telling this story in a bit more tricky and, and more extreme way than we might first imagine. There's, there's something else going on even beyond what we can just see right away. Now, please don't misunderstand. Even though I'm about to suggest a little bit of a revision of how we look at this story, it takes nothing away from the widow herself. We can safely assume that her heart was in the right place, that she did give generously, and she gave out of genuine reverence for God. But it was not this. It was not her that caught Jesus' attention as far as her gift. Given what Jesus had just said in the verses before and after this incident, I no longer think that Jesus was praising this widow as an example of generosity. No, his voice is not full of appreciative wonder at the end of this chapter. In fact, I detect in Jesus' voice a hint of scorn, of criticism, or anger that this situation was what it was. 
This is one of many passages where the larger context just tends to drop away over the years. But the context is absolutely vital if we're going to hear Jesus correctly. If you were reading in Mark's gospel for several chapters before the scripture reading today, Jesus repeatedly connects the temple with corruption. He goes to the temple, and what does he do when he arrives? He throws out all those who were selling and buying there. And then Jesus tells parables. And these are not warm, fuzzy parables. These are parables against the scribes and the Pharisees, the upholders of temple etiquette. Then he sets in the temple, and Jesus begins this passage we read today saying this, Beware of the scribes. Beware of those who like to walk along and uh, around in long robes and be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. Those who like to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at the banquets. Now the scribes of Jesus' day, they were Jerusalem's elite. They were the doctors of the law. Those whose years of study made them the official interpreters of God's word. And in blunt terms, Jesus basically calls the scribes hypocrites. He says, you're a bunch of charlatans. You're a bunch of fakes. He indicates, he says, you guys do the right things just for show. You use impressive clothing as a cover-up for an insincere heart. Jesus pegs these scribes as vain, pompous, proud, arrogant. And all that's bad enough. But the kicker and the key that unlocks the reason why we need a revamped view of this widow's story is when Jesus castigates the scribes for devouring widows' houses. You guys devour widows' houses. Now, of course, the scribes weren't literally devouring houses. I don't even think gingerbread houses had been made yet. But houses refers to the widow's inheritance. It refers to her resources. The scribes were inducing the widows to give their meager resources to the temple. And oh, if you went back and read the Old Testament prophets, you would see how they thundered that these powerful widows, these powerless widows, yeah, make that clear, these powerless widows had a special place in God's heart. But the religious leadership, the very ones who were called to defend and uphold widows, they were manipulating them. And Jesus is not happy with these scribes who rob the poor. They will receive the greater condemnation, Jesus declares. So Jesus, in Mark's gospel so far, has undercut the temple. He's undercut the center of the Jewish religion at the time. And Jesus suggests that the scribes, the temple leaders, are ripping off the poor. And then Jesus sets near the treasury. And he's there as people are bringing their offerings. And many wealthy people come and they give impressive amounts. And then he notices this widow. She enters the temple court and she uncurls her fingers from around two copper coins and lets them fall into the temple treasury where they made such a small sound that only she could hear it. And Jesus calls the disciples over to witness this widow. And he says, hey guys, look at this. Look at this. But notice what he does. He doesn't praise the widow. He doesn't make a value judgment about her great sacrifice. He doesn't say, isn't that great? Look at how she gave. No, Jesus just says, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those contributing to the treasury. Jesus never says, be like her. He only instructs, don't be like the scribes. These religious leaders were doing something that was making the already vulnerable widow population feel obligated to give more than they could afford to give to the temple. That's why when this widow gives away the last two coins that she had to rub together, Jesus sees in that not an example of good stewardship. Instead, what Jesus saw was an example of what the scribes were doing to these poor widows. What Jesus saw was a glaring illustration of how far off track the whole temple enterprise had gotten. This woman felt obligated to give what little she had. And so when Jesus says that's all she had to live on, Jesus said it with exasperation in his voice. She should not have done that. She should not have been told to do that. She shouldn't have been expected to do that. So Jesus' words here are essentially lament. They are an expression of sorrow, an expression of grief. As Jesus watched this widow walk away with nothing to live on, he as much as said to his disciples, hey guys, look at that. 
That's what I'm talking about. See how they devour these poor widows? In short, Jesus is leveling a devastating critique against temple practice and against those who allow, let alone encourage this woman to give all she had to live on. Or in a more literal translation of the Greek, she gave her whole life. She gave her whole life. Now when Mark continues this story in, in the next chapter, if you would read along to Mark chapter 13, the disciples, they go into Jerusalem and they're like tourists. Oh, wow, isn't the temple impressive? It is so amazing. And they're taking cameras and selfies and all this kind of stuff. And Jesus calls attention to the magnificence of, of, of the temple itself. And Jesus proclaims, one day soon, this whole place is going to be sacked. It's all going to be destroyed. In other words, Jesus says that the world as they knew it, the center of the world as they knew it, was going to end. The world centered around the temple and its powerful institutions that support it. They were all coming to an end. It's coming down, Jesus said. And this woman's generosity in the midst of her victimization, this is a sign of what's going to happen. It's because of this kind of stuff that this place is going to fall. So, so this widow's gift isn't just a precious moment scene, is it? The story that Mark tells is not only or even primarily about her generosity. It's about her poverty. Her money, all her money, is given to corruption. She has nothing to live on, and what she did have will only feed the fat cats in charge. She's a harbinger. She's a sign of why God's kingdom must come, of why God's kingdom must come decisively. Because the temple, what was supposed to be the heart of righteousness, what was supposed to be the holiest place on the planet, was so corrupt that nothing but radical divine inbreaking would be able to change it. And so Jesus says, this whole thing is going to change. It's all going to come down. And God's going to take charge. But that leads us to ask, so what? So what? That is, assuming that Jesus' words are words of lament, what does that say to us? What does that say to you and I today? That we should stand up for those who are most vulnerable? Yes, yes, we should stand up for those who are most vulnerable. That we should stand against laws or customs that exploit the poor? Absolutely, we should stand against laws and customs that exploit the poor, the poor if I can say that. That we should enact policies that mirror God's intention to always and, uh, for, and foremost for the least of these? That God cares for those? Yes, no question, we should do that. But while all of these concerns are okay, in what way is that gospel? How is that good news? Because what we just outlined, standing with the oppressed, decrying exploitation, working for better laws, all those are really good things. But where do we find the power to do them? Where do we find the ability to do those things? Well, only good news. Only the gospel can change our hearts. Only the gospel can give us the power to make the difference. So where do we find the gospel? Where do we find the good news in this story? Well, I've got good news. The good news, the gospel of this passage comes in what it says about the God we worship. The God that we see revealed most clearly in Jesus Christ. What does this passage say about our God? Well, this widow was out, out of food, out of money, out of everything. When she lost her husband, she lost not only her place or her name, she lost her identity. She lost her face. She had become invisible. No one saw her anymore. No one is, that is, except for Jesus. Jesus saw her. And the text says that in, plight of, in spite of this woman's plight, at the hands of the corrupt religious leadership, in spite of her giving to a sick system that was preying on people like her, that God sees what's going on. This text says that God sees her plight, that God knows her situation, and that God is doing something about it. It says that this God cares about this woman and her sacrifice. This God sees her and recognizes her affliction. This God will not countenance such abuse especially under the guise of religious piety. And so this God decries those who would order their world and religion to make such sacrifices necessary. That's why this God is in the process of taking down the religious corruption that has sucked this woman dry. When Jesus leaves the temple with his disciples that day, his public ministry is over. In four days, like the widow, he will give his last red cent his whole life not to inflate the corrupt temple treasury, 
but to redeem God's beloved world. He will give that sacrifice somewhere near a trash dump on the outskirts of town on a cross at Golgotha, and he will leave nothing behind. And at that moment, Jesus himself will become the new temple. Jesus will become the meeting place of God and humanity. What an encouragement to continue to serve this God. God is bigger than those who use God. God is bigger than those who manipulate innocent people to their own ends and profit. God is bigger than those institutions that use God's name for self-promotion and self-gain. God is on the side of the little person. God is on the side of the powerless. Yes, God sees this widow and God cares about her. You know, I doubt that anyone else noticed that woman. I doubt that the disciples following Jesus would have noticed her either had Jesus not pointed her out. And this all leads me to conclude that God also sees our struggles. God recognizes our challenges. God cares about where we are hard-pressed to make ends meet. But even more, I think that God is inviting us to do something. God is inviting us to look around. God is inviting us to see each other, to see those in our community we know and, and those we don't. God's inviting us to really see each other, to see the pain of those who are broken, the pain of those who are discriminated against, the desolation of those in poverty, the despair of those who have been abandoned to fend for themselves, the anguish of those who have been exploited by our government and our religious systems. God is inviting us to see them and to care for them. God is inviting us to advocate for a system that doesn't leave anyone behind. And so as we go into this week, May you go forth aware that God sees your struggles and cares about you. But not only that, that God believes in you enough to use you to make a difference in the world. God believes that you have something to contribute. God believes that you can make a difference. God believes that your words and actions can help bring more fully to fruition the kingdom of God's own son. That kingdom that he proclaimed and embodied. And that even when we fall short... The God who raised Jesus from the dead will bring all things in time to a good end. And so that's our message for today in a nutshell. God cares. God cares. And God invites you to care too. Yes, God sees. God knows. God is working toward a just end. His kingdom is coming on earth even as it is in heaven. And he invites us to be a part of it. Amen. Lord, we thank you today. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the good news in this story. And Lord, we thank you for this widow who did, Lord, come and give obediently, Lord, all she had. And Lord, we are thankful for her and her gift, but we're also thankful for what you teach us, that you see the plight of the poor, that you see those who are used and abused by our religious systems and our government systems and our institutions and all of the systems of society, and God, we confess today, we confess that we have been among those, Lord, who have uh, overlooked the poor, that we have contributed, Lord, to systems that, that don't uh, look out for the vulnerable. We confess that today. We ask for your forgiveness. But we see good news here, the good news that you see and you know us. So for those of us, Lord, who are going through those times when we are broken, when we are feeling poor, whether it's poor materially or, or poor in spirit, whatever it is, Lord, give us the encouragement today that you see us and that you care for us. And then, Lord, open our eyes. Help us to see the world around us so that we might, having received your love, go forth to share your love with them. Open our eyes, God, to the places that we might share with those who are vulnerable, those who are broken, those in poverty, oh God. May we be, Lord, those who are about uh, your kingdom work. Lord, may it be so. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We read the story of honor and glory and praise the name of Christ. The preceding presentation came from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland.